My name is Angelina and today I will be taking you on a tour of the Cause Chambers Westgarth offices. So this is our reception area. So for many clients, guests and aspiring clerks, this is the first part of the firm that they see. This is level 18, uh, this is our cafeteria. This is where lawyers come to get their caffeine fix, um, they come get a meal. It's a really great place to catch up with your colleagues. So this is our fabulous balcony. We have a barbecue where we have um, all firm sausage sizzles and for different events we have you know, different um, catered lunches and breakfast and um, the whole firm comes up here and gets to enjoy you know, the beautiful views, get a bit of a tan, you know, de-stress. So what we have here uh, on our client floor is one of our meeting rooms. Um, so they're quite versatile and they're used for a variety of things. So for example, they could be used for negotiations, mediation, um, meeting clients, internal firm presentations. Um, there's uh, video conferencing capabilities, so if a client or um, another office needs to participate in a meeting, they can dial in. So these are the working floors of Paul's Chambers Westgarth. Our firm is distributed from level nine up to level 18. This is my working space. Uh, this is what's called a pod. And as I mentioned before, Cause has an open plan structure. So a pod would typically have a senior associate, a partner, uh, the lawyers and the law grads and being in a pod enables you to work together collaboratively. Well, I hope you enjoyed a look of our offices. I'm about to go and film the podcast now. You are listening to Insights, produced by the University of New South Wales Law Society, a podcast dedicated to bring you an insight into law school, the legal profession and legal issues. The production team would also like to show our respects and acknowledge the Bedigal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land, of elders past and present on which this podcast is made. Westgarth are a gold sponsor of UNSW Law Society and are Australia's leading independent law firm. Known for delivering legal excellence, exceptional client service and outstanding results. With offices across Australia and Papua New Guinea, as well as a leading network of strategic alliances across the globe, their clients include more than half of the top 50 ASX listed companies, some of the largest privately owned companies in Australia and a number of global Fortune 500 companies. They have been named an Employer of Choice 2020 by Australasian Lawyer and a Top 25 Attraction Firm 2020 by Lawyers Weekly. Cores have 17 practice groups nationally, and for this episode of the podcast, we are lucky to have three lawyers from Cores who are members of the Cores Technology, Media and Telecommunications team, or TMT for short. They are a band one team on the Chamber's ranking, representing tech giants such as US and Chinese social media giants, leading te telecommunications companies and international media conglomerates. They are here today for a roundtable on what their role is and what the world of technology law looks like. James North is a partner and the head of the TMT practice group at Cause. In 2020, he was named Telecommunications and Media Partner of the Year at the Lawyers Weekly Partner of the Year Awards. James is UNSW alumni, and before joining Cause, he worked at Freehills and at Allen and Overy in London. James Wallace is a senior associate in the team who joined Cause as a summer clerk in 2012 and 2013. James has advised clients such as TPG, Amazon, and Viacom CBS. He is interested in public, poli public policy implications for the tech sector. Also joining us is Angelina Yolova, who is a lawyer in the team and is also UNSW alumni and prior to joining cause worked as a paralegal, funnily enough at Allen and Overy. A huge welcome and thank you to the team for joining us today. So just going into a few general questions about the team. 
Um, firstly, going back in time, what made you all choose to study law? Angela, where would you like to start? Um, so while I was, when I was growing up, I was inspired by the iconic lawyers such as Atticus Finch and Elle Woods. Admittedly, <laughs> admittedly um, I did uh, need some reflection before um, settling on a law degree. So while I was in high school, I loved science and maths, but I also loved humanity subjects like ancient history. So I thought for me, law was kind of the perfect combination uh, that you know utilizes the critical thinking skills and the logic that you see in math science subjects, but also has a rich humanities and philosophical foundation. Yeah, for sure. What about you, James? So I equally had a, a great interest in sort of human rights and justice issues. I was particularly interested in international law at that time. But to be honest, I was planning a, a, a career in business at that stage, and I was I added the law degree partly for personal interest, but also because from a professional perspective, I was interested in how regulation and public policy affect business models and the success or failure of business. So that was my, that was my main uh, objective in studying law from a professional perspective. Yeah, very interesting to hear. And James? Um, I was also interested in public policy. So I was interested in how, how laws can help people, but also hurt people. Um, and so I chose to study law and social sciences, and I really enjoyed that mix. Yeah, lovely. A lot of very similar backgrounds coming together here. Um, so moving on, James and Angelina, um, what would you say is your most memorable moment studying at UNSW? Oh, there's a, a lot of great memories for me. Um, uh, we had a great opportunity to meet eminent members of the profession. So I can remember Malcolm Turnbull, who was our Prime Minister, but back then he was a barrister and he came and gave a, a speech which was uh, very inspiring, talking about the importance of the justice system and um, and human rights and, and the rule of law. And I found that a really inspiring uh, speech and, and great motivation for my career. But also a lot of fun, like the law review. We used to, when we had gaps in our, our timetable, we used to sneak off to the Coogee Bay Hotel and play pool. And it was really a great time in my life. Yeah, trust me, nothing has changed. <laughs> I think that's still very much our lives today. Um, what about you, Angelina? Yeah, so completely unbiased opinion, but I absolutely loved my time at UNSW. You know, being a t typical type A person, I threw myself at all the extracurriculars, such as UNSW Law Society, UNSW Law Journal, and all the different competitions that UNSW had to offer. Um, so it's, it's very hard choosing just one, but I, I would say... Um, a really memorable um, experience was law camp because it was actually a foundation for uh, a lot of my friendships in law school and actually one of my great uh, closest friends at law camp she actually works with me at cause here oh, wow. so, yeah so fun fact and um, I guess another moment I'm very proud of is um, I was the editor-in-chief of the UNSW Law Society uh, social justice publication called Court of Conscience so I was in charge of putting together that publication and launching the 10th edition and we actually had Human Rights Commissioner Ed Santo um, attend as the keynote speaker so that was a pretty yeah, proud wow. moment for me. Sounds good. Glad to have so many UNS lobby perspectives in the room. Um, so next question is on to TMT. Um, so technology seems to be extremely you know science, maths and engineering focused. So James I wanted to ask you how difficult it was taking the leap from studying commerce and law into specialising within TMT? Uh, I don't think it was difficult. I mean, I've, I've al already, I've always had an interest in science and engineering. I studied science for the HSC and I've got an interest in how things work. Um, so when we're looking for lawyers to come into the TMT uh, team, we don't require anyone to have a science degree. I think f first and foremost, you've got to be a good lawyer. Um, but it also helps and it's, it's very important that you have an inquiring mind and that you're interested in innovation and sort of future business models. Uh, but I don't think it's essential that you have a science degree. Yeah, for sure. That's good to hear. Um, and also similar to you, Angelina, you did a Bachelor of Arts, right? Um, did you ever imagine or have a solid idea that you wanted to practice in the TMT group? 
Yeah, so like I said, in high school I was quite torn between choosing a humanities degree or a science degree and ultimately I chose an arts degree majoring in philosophy and a minor in international relations. I do think that um, it taught me, you know, necessary legal skills as James mentioned, like clear and succinct writing, which is very important in our practice group. But as James said, it ultimately doesn't matter as long as you have a curiosity and a thirst for knowledge about technology, startups and innovation, that's all you really need. And as part of my law degree, I actually did take quite a few, um, I guess, tech-based subjects like communications law, um, IP law and designing technology solutions for access to justice. Yeah, wow, it's good to hear. Um, so we've heard so much about the background of TMT, um, but what's a day working in the group actually like? James, did you want to start? Um, sure. Um, well, uh, when we're allowed back in the office, um, I normally get to the office around eight or nine. Um, and the day is sort of a mix, I suppose, between meeting with clients and helping clients on uh, their negotiations with vendors or other types of issues that arise. Um, and then also sort of working back at your desk with the rest of the team. Um, so after a meeting with a client, we might turn the documents so we might make some changes or some edits to the contract they're negotiating. Um, or I might head back and work with some of the other lawyers in the team on some of the advices that they're preparing. Um, so it's a bit of a mix between, I suppose, client-facing uh, meetings, um, but also just getting down to the nuts and bolts of contracts and uh, regulatory advices. Yeah, great. Um, James and Angelina, also interested to hear your opinions because you are all in different positions, right? So does that day sort of differ depending on where you sit? Yeah, absolutely. So as you become more senior, but your, your, your role becomes more focused on communication. You know, the younger lawyers will do a lot of research, they'll do a lot of drafting, and they'll tend to be working on one or two things. Whereas you become more senior, you, you tend to be inputting into a, a, a larger range of matters, but also talking to clients about, um, you know, potential new jobs, doing some marketing, Occasionally, I'll talk to a journalist uh, about a new um, sort of legislative initiative that they want uh, industry comment on. And then I spend a lot of time on the phone to international clients. So my day will often start with emails and Zoom calls with American clients because of the time difference. And it'll often end in the evening with a call with a UK law firm or a UK client. Um, so that's, uh, you know, it changes as you become more senior and you become more relationship focused and more focused on communication as well as that having that underpinning of you know the, the 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 legal work that's going on yeah for sure um angelina did you have anything to add to that yeah so as both james and james have already alluded as a junior you're doing a lot of drafting and a lot of research so um we at cause we take the perspective that you know when you're a junior lawyer your seniors are your clients so mm -hmm. when we're producing a piece of work whether it's research or drafting we have to prepare it as if it is client facing but it will go through that process of review and you know feedback so um, as I have become a bit more experienced, I am starting to do a lot more client facing work now. But when you're starting out, it's all about kind of learning by osmosis and work shadowing, sitting on calls, taking file notes. And it's a great way to um, yeah, observe and learn. For sure. Um, next question is a bit of a fun one. Um, so I just wanted to know what your go to activities are when you have a break, any hobbies? So I like to try and keep fit. I do spin classes at the gym, which um, is is great way to de-stress and also stay fit as well. And I have a adorable little puppy, a cavoodle called Charlie, who I spend a lot of time with. Um, it wasn't meant to be my dog. It was meant to be my daughter's dog, and she was going to look after him. But I'm. Uh, in charge of him now and uh, yeah I'm, I'm very happy with that I could be happy with that. that tends to happen with um, dogs and parents yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a Parramatta Reels tragic um, so almost every weekend I go to a Parramatta Reels game and um, I do that with my family so that's one of my sort of big outlets outside of work yeah, as, as lawyers, we obviously do a lot of sitting down and, you know, a lot of time indoors. So I do try and get outdoors. And 
I quite like swimming, so I used to be a swimmer when I was younger. Um, so I try and, you know, keep up, you know, the fitness by trying to swim, but, you know, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good to hear about the range of hobbies um, taking shape here. Uh, and moving on into just lawyers and STEM in general, uh, for those who might be unfamiliar with the sector, what is technology, media and telecommunications? So, so within course, that's a practice group. We have a range of different practice groups and some of them are industry agnostic. So we have commercial litigation, we have corporate and M&A, and they really work in any industry. We're a little bit different in the sense that we, you know, almost exclusively work for these three industries. And so we have people with a range of different skill sets. You might have commercial lawyers, you might have regulatory lawyers, litigators, corporate people, but what they share in common is that they all have an industry, uh, they, they have clients who work in these industries and uh, they have an interest in these, these industries. And we think we provide a better uh, service to our clients by having that industry focus. And in the past, we've put them together because in the past they were three separate industries, but because of convergence, they've all really come together. And if you think like a a company like Netflix, which is a media company, is not that different from a technology company these days. And that's why we think it makes sense to put them all together. Yeah, definitely. Um, And there's also a common sentiment that, you know, technology development technological development is outpacing legal developments Mm. so would you agree with that yeah absolutely and i think it's inevitable i mean a good example of that is that is ride sharing so if you think about when uh, some of the ride sharing companies came uh, onto the scene prior to that we had some uh, regulation of taxi services really wasn't suited to ride sharing Um, and for a while until the point-to-point transport regulations were passed that business model was actually illegal Um, so one of the great things about working in our industry is you have people coming with you with new innovative business models which are really like a square peg in a round hole uh, and that makes it really exciting to to work in this in this space yeah definitely sounds like you work with a very expansive reach of companies Um, and what type of challenges would you say that you face when advising those clients Okay. Um, I just think um, probably the observation I would make is that when they're coming up with a disruptive business model, um, their ambition is to disrupt the market. So that's the position they're starting from. So sometimes when you're providing legal advice around how to achieve regulatory compliance, if that doesn't perfectly fit with their model, sometimes they'll be uneasy about making changes. Um, So we have to talk them through the implications of that and also help them to understand what the current regulations are. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things I think our team does particularly well and CORE does well generally is we tend to be on the front foot of tracking public policy implications to changes in the law. So sometimes you'll actually have... (laughs) You know, the reverse of what James says, where you'll have something like the consumer data right will be introduced, um, which is an ability for people to have their personal data and consumer data shared between businesses. And that will actually spark new business models, um, which can cause disruption in the industry. So you have sort of a reverse there where you have legislation being introduced, which creates sectors. And I think it's about playing a bit of a role between those two things. For sure. Um, and also, James, you mentioned earlier rideshare companies and Netflix and the like. Um, do you ever interact with startup companies? Um, and what would you say are some of the most interesting clients and ideas that you've seen within that sort of work? Yeah, so we, we interact with startups in a number of ways. Sometimes we work directly for startups. Sometimes we work for venture firms investing in startups. And then increasingly we work for big corporations who have in, uh, in-house venture arms where they're trying to effectively disrupt themselves by creating a separate space for innovation within a large corporation. Um, and so there's a, there's a, we're working with some really interesting uh, companies at the moment. We're working for a global tech company that um, is developing an aerial drone service. So it's a bit like you know, Deliveroo or Uber Eats, but it's delivered through a, an aerial drone. That's really exciting. James meant, uh, mentioned consumer data right. Um, we are working with some ventures who are taking people's personal banking uh, data and turning that into a product whereby they offer savings and wealth management advice 
you know, looking at the specific things that they spend their money on on a day-to-day basis and creating that into a, a sort of savings product. So that's very interesting as well. And we've just recently been working for a, a, a US company called StockX, which is a high-end uh, sneaker exchange of all things. Um, so that's very exciting as well. Yeah, very exciting. Um, And just on the topic of, you know, data and privacy, um, and feel free to jump in, anyone, at any any time. Um, As a lawyer working for, you know, large tech companies and advising them of privacy and data protection laws, do you ever feel like you have that greater responsibility to your client just to figure out workarounds for data management or a greater responsibility for those potential users to protect the way their data is used? Um, uh, there's lots of public policy issues about around uh, data privacy and discussion about what's the right, um, you know, regulatory set for, for data at the moment, which is very interesting. But when our clients come to us, they want to comply with the law. And so they are asking us, how do we comply with the law? So we don't really see a tension between those two things. Um, uh, you know, even even these days, Australian privacy law is fairly stringent around how data is used. You need to be transparent about what you intend to use the data for, and get the consumer's consent if you we want to use it for a, for another purpose. Uh, so, to to my mind, um, I don't see I don't have a conflict around that issue. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for the insight about TMT. Um, just moving on to some questions about cause in general and working here. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with the law firm environment, what's the career progression like um, at cause and what are the different responsibilities of, say, a senior associate or a lawyer? Yep. Yeah, so CORS has a quite a clear-cut career progression and structure. So most of the junior lawyers start out here as clerkships and basically a clerkship is an opportunity to work at the firm over the summer or spring for UNSW um, and gain experiences in a range of teams. And then at the end of the clerkship process, uh, graduate offers come out and a graduate program is basically once you finish uni, you come back to to cause to start your graduate program and generally that uh, takes shape in the form of three rotations. For, for example, I rotated through property, TMT and corporate and at the end of the three rotations you choose a team to settle in and um, I guess after that promotions are very much um, yeah, merit based and I've already covered some of the, I guess, lawyer responsibilities in terms of like work shadowing and research so I might hand over to James to talk about the senior associate level. Sure Um, I think probably the first thing to say is what I found at least in our team in TMT but I think more broadly across the firm is that um, when you're a junior lawyer so you're a graduate or a lawyer or an associate um, you sort of will do direct work for the partner um, partners that you're working for and you also have a chance to engage directly with clients so it's not so much a matter of you have to wait years into your career and before you're meeting with clients and providing advice or working directly with the more senior members of the firm I think that happens from day one at course which is a really good thing um, but as you do sort of go through levels, I suppose the promotions from lawyer to associate to senior associate, you do take on more responsibility in your work um, and sometimes the work will become a little bit more complicated. Uh, but the main part of what I've noticed is that you have a greater responsibility to the more junior members of your team, so to the lawyers and to the associates, um, and to helping them with their work and helping them tackle some of the more complicated questions that come up. So you sort of have an oversight responsibility that emerges um, but it's, I guess, it's more of a assisting them in their uh, in their work more than anything. Yeah, definitely. Good to hear about different perspectives from the firm. And um, so let's just talk about our journeys with Cause. Um, and if it's okay to ask, James, if you could briefly describe what your journey was like to partnership. Sure. So I, I as you mentioned before, I started off at another Australian firm and then fairly early in my career, I decided I wanted to go to... Europe, partly for personal reasons because I wanted to travel and uh, partly for professional reasons because, you know, the opportunities to work in London and across Europe uh, were just fantastic. Um, And I spent six years at Allen Ivory in London and had a a wonderful time there Um, and then decided to come back to Australia. 
and um, and then became a partner three or four years later than that. And you know, in in some ways, at the time, I thought, oh, this is taking too long. I should be a partner now. I can remember being sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of anxious to get to the to the partnership goal and in, in a way spending six years in London delayed that slightly because one of the most important things about um, becoming a partner or establishing a business case to be a partner is having relationships with clients and although you get amazing experience working offshore you really need relationships with Australian clients but you know looking back I wouldn't trade that time for anything because it, I just had such a wonderful work experience in Europe and, and learned so much that I think it's really helped me in good stead uh, uh, in my later years of my career. Yeah, definitely. So good to hear about that individual perspective. Um, and the next one is a bit of a quick question, but if you were to describe cause culture with one word, what would it be? Collaborative. <laughs> respect. I would also say respect. I think cause is a yeah. very respectful culture. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and what's something you think law students should know when applying for clerkships at cause? So I interview a lot of clerks and we are obviously very interested in getting you know the best and brightest uh, in our clerkship program but what I would encourage um, uh, young clerks or applicants for clerkship programs to do is to really try and understand the firm that they're applying for and going back to the culture question you uh, you just mentioned what is the culture of the firm that you want to work for and does that suit you because as much as I want a talented lawyer I also want someone who is passionate about cause and working for cause and as, as hard as it is because sometimes at law school you can look at all the firms and say oh they all look a bit the same to the extent you can talk to people you know, alumni that you know who've worked there or friends who have worked there and really try and delve into the culture of the firm you're applying to. I think that's really important. Mm. I think I would add to that, and you don't, when you go for, you know, to apply to law firms like Course, you don't need to have worked out already what your career is going to look like. You know, it's okay to go to the firm and to go to the interviews and say, I'm interested in these areas. I'm interested in litigation and TMT and the renewable energy sector, but I don't necessarily know exactly where I want my career path to go. I think it's okay to say that. And the firm, cause we structure our program on that basis. So we enable people on their clerkship to undergo a number of rotations. And then when they're graduates, we enable them to experience different areas of the firm, as Angelina mentioned, rotating through property and TMT and corporate. So I think that's really important to understand is you don't have to have your career set in stone. You can come in with an open mind. Yeah, definitely. I would um I would emphasize being authentic and I think cause interviews are generally quite conversational. Um, so it's about like James was saying, getting to know you and getting to know your interests and your passion. And I've had quite a few uh, quite a few law students come to me and say, but how do I stand out? And my advice would be, you know, don't underestimate the power of being. Um, prepared, being confident, being genuine and being passionate because I believe that will get you far in the clerkship process. Definitely some good advice. Um, and what do you all think is the most challenging aspect of your jobs? I'll go first. I, I think it's probably um, the technical details. Um, and sometimes it's easy as a lawyer when you're working on a complicated matter to get lost in the technical aspects and to forget what is the overall commercial drivers for the client and what are the key risks they're trying to mitigate against. I think sometimes it's good um, when you've been, you know, deep looking at an issue to take a step back and to really think of it from a holistic approach. Um, and sometimes when you're rushing to get work done, you can get lost a little bit uh, in the woods. And so it's good to take a good step back and really assess what the key risks are you're advising on. Yeah. So we work with clients who are developing really highly technical, innovative products. Um, and going back to your initial question about how do you bridge the gap between science and law, like I think the answer to that is really good communication. So we talk a lot to engineers. We talk to a lot to really you know, ambitious, intelligent founders of venture companies, being able to communicate clearly with them and understand, as James said, their technical and, and commercial objectives is really critical. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, I would say a challenge, I think, for most lawyers is we're living in unprecedented times with COVID-19 and um, cause has been, you know, a big supporter of flexible working and remote working and our team, you know, we we've uh, we work flexibly as well. So we generally try and come in two, three days into the office, obviously, depending on what kind of deals we have on. But other days uh, we can work remotely and we do video conferences and, um, you know, and that's and that's great. But I, th I think a big challenge that comes with that is setting that boundary between personal life and work, um, because when you're at home and you've always got your laptop there and you can log on log off any time I think it's harder to set that boundary so I think you really need to be strict with yourself and you know enforce you know your kind of working hours take you know like have a schedule take a break kind of like you would in the office mm -hmm. um, because yeah I think um, it, sometimes it's hard you know those boundaries get blurred so definitely and do you think you've got a better grasp over working from home now yeah I think it was quite tough at first because um it was, um, you know, when, when we got the mandate to work from home, it was, um, yeah, it was quite sudden. I don't think anyone was prepared. I was actually still doing a graduate rotation and, you know, that's, that's obviously hard. So I feel for all the graduates out there that went through that because you're there to try and, you know, engage with a new team and make a good impression. And then you kind of had to go and work from home, um, like, you know, five days a week, so full time. So it was definitely a challenge, but I think over time, and I think especially our team, we've kind of found, um, our own, um, I guess, yeah, schedule and pace. And like I said, we've got, you know, certain days where we come in and certain days where we work from home. So I think we've definitely gotten better. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, and finally, you know, as a law student, uh, just wanted to know if you had any advice to law students or even aspiring law students out there. I think uh, just going back to what James is saying, being open to having uh, sort of different uh, experiences in your legal career and and not being too set on what you want to want to do before you start your legal career not deciding I want to be a corporate lawyer or I want to be a litigator because having different experiences in different areas of the law you know only benefit you I think so being open to change I think is a good is good advice I'd probably add to that and say maybe in the final one or two years of your law degree is to read the paper and follow what's happening in the news and what government policies are and what, what business are talking about. I think having that understanding when you start your career, whether it's at a law firm or, or whether it's in a different in, in business or in management consulting or some other area, is very helpful to just be across what the broad narratives are in Australia at the moment. And I guess I'll just conclude by saying, you know, for everyone at university, be proactive, be inquisitive, take initiative. Um, you know, law, the legal profession is such um, a broad, you know, such a broad spectrum and caters to so many industries. So as James and James were saying, sometimes you don't even know what's out there until you, you know, go and try and um, try all these different experiences. So I would definitely recommend getting involved in um, like competitions, law societies, um, just any, you know, any events that come up because I really found that because I gave, you know, I put in a lot of effort, like the university life gave a lot back to me. Yeah, that's such valuable advice, especially coming from a UNSW student, ex-UNSW student. <laughs> well, thank you so much, James, James and Angelina for your time today and for coming on this podcast with us. Um, I think I can speak for everyone and all our listeners and viewers when I say that we've gained so much valuable insight from you and definitely have a much better understanding of cause now. Um, thank you for listening to Insights by UNSW Law Society. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast so that you don't miss out on any future episodes.